Welcome, Dream Team, to another episode of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby in partnership with City Index, the leading providers of spread betting, CFD and FX trading, as I'm sure you know by now. Tins is alongside. How, how are we feeling out of 10? Actually, my shoulder is a little bit sore. Right. So maybe... We're not giving away too many trade secrets, but we can say we've had a very good weekend in Ireland. Yeah, we did have a good weekend. And thank you to Jane and Johnny, if they're listening. Thank you to Jane hosts, and Johnny. Hosts of most. Um, but yeah, it was good. It was good crap, wasn't it? The Bushnells got us a little bit at the end, but... Yeah, I have to say my wife, I woke up this morning, my wife said, Jesus Christ, I've never seen you look so poor in all your life. <laughs> she said you could be 70, but we've reinflated ourselves and we're going again on Monday. It's a very warm welcome to Leicester City's goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> the fourth wheel very on our good. car. Very good. You're out of isolation. How are you? I am, yeah, I'm fresh. Um, I didn't get to go away because of the protocol at all, but after the bye week on recharge, 17 days off. Wow. Mid season can ask for much more. Could you're you? always complaining about the fact you're playing yeah. too much rugby. You've got to take the yeah. break when it comes. I know, yeah. I literally I said I was cold today as well, and I've got shorts on, so <laughs> bit of a hypocrite lately. Do you, I do feel sorry for the first man who's having to make the tackle on the baby. No, it's, you feel so much more after like a week off or two weeks off. You literally every single knock is ten times worse. So I'm <laughs> dreading it really, yeah. Right. <laughs> we should say you're Leicester City goalkeeper because you're coming at the liveliest top I've seen in a long time. This is decent. Yeah. Guns. I've got four as well, but like all in different colours. So I think that's a thing we're going to get going. Um, and we've asked you to bring in Show and Tell this week. And what have you brought in for us on the show this week? You didn't ask us to bring Show and Tell. Well, you've brought it. You've brought <laughs> you in brought a very it. impressive <laughs> Show and Tell. Show them. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got Freddie Stewart. Hello. Very, very, very nice to, to be have here. Your side. One of the golden childs at the moment. <sighs> God, stop it. How are you? If anything's letting him down, it's just the tash, isn't it? Yeah, give it a couple of years it'll really can kick we, in. can we just confirm this is Movember this is Movember it yeah. is my attempt at Movember it was a, a week earlier I had to have Ed start and I'm still not sure <laughs> if you'd be able to see it from there but it's um, it's patchy it's awful and it's going tomorrow so. it's the thickest patchiest tash I've ever seen yeah. it's like real thick but real patchy at the same time <laughs> so it's like thick Patchy thick. It's just know? a mess of like, it, really. It's like Morse code. As if someone's got a real, real strong code. <laughs> yeah, right, Ellis. You know? Real big gaps. Yeah. yeah. You can get those roller things. It's like sort of like it's like a scour for your lawn, which brings up the grass. You can, you can get those roller things that you put over the top of it. need to invest. We'll, we'll buy one. It's not something it that will be coming back till next November. Um, <laughs> it's very good to have you alongside. Just give us, I mean, how good is life right now? What a month. In fact, what a six months you've had, but what a month in particular. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been unbelievable. A bit crazy, really. You know, I got an opportunity this week with a week off to sort of um, just sit back and take in what's happened because when you're in it it sort of flashes by and you're so involved in it and, and in it that you, you don't really have a chance to look back at it and, and sort of appreciate what's going on so no it's been a really nice opportunity just to, to look back at that four weeks and, and it's been awesome We'll talk about the rugby as we go but what have you done with your week off? Um, I got to go home and see family uh, Monday and Tuesday which is very nice because I've not been able to get home for a while back in Norfolk so that was a, that was a really nice couple of days there Yeah. Um, went back to, to Loughborough which is where I'm at the moment um, and then managed to get up to see some friends in Newcastle um, over the weekend which was uh, which was brilliant um, I had a good fun, good fun there you can probably hear my voice it's still a little bit dusty <laughs> <Yeah>. but <laughs> well deserved I'm sure um, I'm never a, a bad night out in Newcastle. Never a bad exactly. night out. Is the boat still going in Newcastle? <laughs> well, now you're showing your age. You. Now you're <laughs> showing your age. I haven't been there for about 20 years, but it always used to be, that used to be the focal point. What's the focal point in Newcastle now? Uh, I'd have to say Market Shaker. That's where we were right. on, on Saturday night, and that was, uh, yeah. that was good fun. So did, did, did you head to Filthies? Not heard of Filthies either. Uh, we were, right. we, one of our dining guests on the weekend, the Irishman Peter Dolan, owns, oh, yeah. owns Filthies. It's great, great oh. place, actually. That's where I was after the Champions Cup final that was up there. Oh, are you? Yes. Well, well worth a visit, everyone in Newcastle. Next Good. time I'm there, I'm sure they'll know I'll about be it. sure to visit. Is life different? Um, I wouldn't say so, no, not really. Um, it's, it's sort of, you know, you're in it, you're, you're away in that sort of bubble and that environment and then now we're home again and it's back to Leicester and, and life is on as normal. So it's nice to, it's nice to almost be back and just be back to, to sort of the day in, day out back at Leicester and back to work. Do you, do you get a bit of a clip in training? Have you gone, Ellis, have you gone hunting him just to make sure that... We the, trained yet. Yeah, trained yet. Uh, so he's still walking on <laughs> yes, water. So we'll see, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. I, I'm always fascinated as to, and, and I'd love to kind of explore this with you, but as someone who's... It's going quickly in his career. It's happening very quickly for you. You know, what are the sort of what are the the bits that you're holding on to quite tight just to make sure it's it's not all happening too fast, if you know what I mean? Um, I think it's just uh, appreciating that it's been a it's been an awesome campaign, but it's only the you know you, you don't 
it's three games and there's a lot of stuff going on the minute people saying things but for me it's just that it's three games yeah. did all right but you know it doesn't make you a superstar doing stuff in three games you know it's potentially a 10 12 year career so it's look at that and appreciating that it's gone really well and I'm I'm really pleased with, with how it all went but now it's about you know can it that, add that consistency can it be a thing that continues um, and that's sort of a little bit of motivation to get back and get back to it uh, what's both has been like because I know he, he was always very good at making sure people's feet stayed firmly on the ground even when he was 18 he was screaming at internationals and he'd never played an international but how has he been? Yeah he's been brilliant as I, as Genji said we haven't been in actually since it was only today the first time but he's probably the best man to be going back to you know Steve's awesome little, and that sort of thing Little so. phone call? Uh, yeah yeah I've been speaking to him throughout the campaign so uh, yeah a little phone call here and there and um, I'm sure he'll be very on me for that <laughs> <laughs> This is the most 2021 question but it kind of gives a sense of how things are going how much did the Instagram following go up? Yeah uh, it, the, it, it uh, went mental did it really? Um, it did. It really did. After after the Australia game, it, it sort of went a bit mental. Then South Africa again, it, it went even more. Um, so, I, so what have you gone from? Three, four, five? I think it was seven or eight to now about 26 or okay. 27. So it's just blown up, which is uh, it's weird because, you know, we're just playing rugby and then that sort of thing is just going, yeah, it's, it has been a bit mental. But, uh, <laughs> how well did he do? No, he was brilliant. Um, obviously, I was only there for a week and a bit and spent a summer with him where... I don't know, you were sort of finding your feet, I guess, in the summer because mm. you, you haven't played much rugby before that, really. It's only your first season and like consistently in the in the first team with us for a, for a year. So, <clears throat> but I've been at the club with Fred now, what, f- three years? Three years now, two yeah. and a bit years. And you played for the 20s and stuff and like, being honest, when you first came in, you were pretty garbage, weren't you? Was, like, yeah, I was. His first year, mate, Jordy Murphy was like, this kid's mustard. And I was like, yeah? <laughs> yeah, mustard. Like, he's obviously a big lad, like, gets the high ball. He's like jumping the ball, bats behind him <laughs> and that. So, to watch his development over the last few years, it's, it's been class. And now to see, like, the fruits come to labour and stuff, it's, it's unreal. Good it's on unreal. You. What, where, well where, done, how do you sort of look at the last, I mean, because we'll deal with the, the autumn itself, but how do you look at the last, two, three years. And and what has been integral to getting to where you are now? If you came in as a kid who was in the wrong postcode when the ball went up, what what is integral <laughs> now to being, you know, an absolute bomb disposal unit? Um, I think for me, it's just always been about the next thing. So try not to sort of look too far ahead. Um, so like Genji says in that first year when I was just this gangly, tall, skinny guy who didn't really, didn't really found his place. It was... Um, just trying to find, think, find things to work at, find skills that I can really work hard at. Um, and from there on, just hard work, I suppose. I think I was never even thinking about England or or even Leicester first team when I first came in, really. That wasn't where I thought I would be able to get to immediately. Um, and it just sort of all happened very quickly. I worked hard, um, got an opportunity. I think you might have been playing. It was against Sale Away. I was a, a travelling reserve. I just I was at school still. I got the call because there was a couple of injuries at fullback and they got me on the bus to sail. Um, I remember all the boys were in their hotel rooms. I didn't have one because I was a traveling with so I was there doing my schoolwork in the canteen. Um, I was <laughs> I mean, thinking, just, oh, just on that, I mean, how brutal is that to be doing homework in front of... I know. Not just Leicester, but England legends as well. Were they sympathetic and encouraging with your algebra? Uh, I don't think they were all <laughs> chilling in the hotel. Guaranteed when I was there they didn't help, home. right? No, <laughs> definitely not. But I was never in the the sort of mental frame of mind that I I would play that. I'd play that night, and we got to the stadium, warmed up, and George, one of the fullbacks, uh, I saw him sort of walk off with a little hobble, and I thought, oh my, like. <laughs> and um, then Geordie came over to me and said, "You're gonna, we're gonna need you on the bench." So I, I sort of had 15 minutes to sort of get ready for that and be like, oh my word, I, c- I could be coming on the premiership here as a, as a young kid. Um, and then I got on, I think it was like the 76th minute, first thing they kicked behind me, caught it and got absolutely bundled straight into the dead ball, five metres scrum sale and they scored. So it was a bit of a baptism of fire, but um, that was a, a pretty weird experience. And and then it was just from there, like Prem Cup chances then when there were a couple of injuries and... And then Steve came in and, and there it was just about working hard in that preseason and, and, and just trying to get picked with him. Were you, were, were you a big rugby playing kid or did you find it late? What, what was your route into the game? Um, so my older brother played a lot of rugby and I sort of came into it through him. So we used to go down on a Sunday to my local rugby club, Swaffham. Um, and that's where he played. And I actually hated it to start with. I remember I used to lock myself in the car, didn't want to play, wasn't interested. Um, and that was when I was about four or five. And then slowly got introduced and slowly started to fall in love with it. And then I've played, yeah, since I was about five, six, 
every Sunday, you know, proper grassroots at my local rugby club. Um, and then played a bit at school and, th- and then got into to Leicester through there. Interesting. And have you always been a fullback? Because actually you started at eight. Mm. You must have started at 10 or 12. No, um, I started at eight. Moved you both started at eight. Prop for like under 12s. Then okay. eight at 13, 14, centre. Wing at 16. You were wing at 16? Wing. Played the uh, Somerset at wing, yeah. Number 11. <laughs> Holy Moses, I did oh, not yeah. know that. I had like five tries in the Mendip final. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got a video you, of it. Have you got a step on uh, you or are you just a little no. sort of the Maori side yeah, step? forward step. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had an opposition winger who was playing touch and you didn't, yeah. you didn't understand that you didn't get the game. Um, and then back to eight and then back to prop, obviously, yeah. Alan Martinovich That's... scouted me for heartbreak. Playing centre against Colston's for Canesham. I did not know that. Yeah. That's a full. That's a full circle of that. Yeah. Oh, that's a time. I just played everywhere where you didn't have to distribute. Yeah. <laughs> so if it's ever needed, I'm going to come back to the question already. But if it's ever needed, would you offer to step out? Yeah, I'd in? love to. Yeah, really? I'd be more comfortable on the wing. I think than in the centre It's a bit harder to read the D in the centre, isn't it? I think it's a guessing game on the edge. <laughs> you you can't do a job. By the looks, of, you, things, you, by the looks of things, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> the campaign. We got the campaign for England captaincy through the um, through passport. You're control. pushing the we're wing now, we're now, now. We'll push one for you to <laughs> get out on the wing. Eddie's, Eddie said, the "Props could well." A winger can play back row. Why can't a prop play a wing? Yeah, I do think maybe that, that's probably where the game needs to go, isn't it? Everyone needs to sort of start mixing positions up, especially with the cap coming down and squads being a bit tighter now. You got to play multiple positions. Yeah, put my name in the app. You're gonna you're <laughs> gonna offer 15 and second, second row. row you second in there. row, yeah, yeah. I get the odd joke about getting me up in the line out. It never gets old. Um, we got Roy McConaughey up in the line out at the World Cup. And, really? uh, was it World Cup? Yeah, against USA. I'd oh, actually right. love to. I think similar build, yeah. Yeah, get me up there. It's like, yeah, re- no. like reversing the batting order. I love it. Have, have you always been a 15, though? <laughs> no, I used to play um, fly half when I was was younger. And no. then I did, I promise you. To about, through to about 12, 13, and then played in the centres till I was about 15. And I didn't really pick up fullback till I was about 16, 17. <laughs> Obsessing the distribution, you're getting slowly pushed further and further <laughs> yeah, wider. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You can't play there, no, further out. Yeah, and ended up at fullback um, when I was about 16, yeah. yeah Coach back then just said... Um, look, just want to have a go there and, and then loved it. And tell me about the uni. Are you studying at the moment at Loughborough? Yeah, trying to. And you, um, what, what are you doing? Uh, economics. Wow. Um, with a bit of Spanish as well. So wow. I'm keeping myself busy. Spanish. Yeah. Spanish, yeah. Well, well, we, don't we, don't we, ask we. me to say anything, Alice, because I... I think the Spanish economy needs a bit of help, actually. So you've got an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. um, that, to, to, how have you ended up doing that? Is that something, you know... Could, could, actually, this, cause, uh, this goes on to a broader point, but how have you, how have you ended up doing um, Spanish? Well, I, after school, I thought, obviously, I wasn't sure at that point that rugby would be, you know, a full-time thing, whether I'd be able to pursue that as a career. Because at that point, I was sort of uncertain whether I'd be good enough to make it. So I thought it, it would be good to sort of get some uni stuff going on the side. Because um, you just never know when rugby's going to finish. It could be an injury, it could be, could be anything. Um, so I sort of enjoyed Eckert, well, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it, but I had an interest in economics at school. Yeah. Um, and, and then Leicester were brilliant in sort of allowing me to study at Loughborough while I was with Leicester. So in my first year at Leicester, I was sort of in and out of, of Leicester, doing a lot of Loughborough, played a couple of times on loan there um, in the Buck stuff, which was really, that was actually really good fun. Um <laughs> And then I've found it more difficult, obviously, as the degree's gone on and I'm in my, my final year now, which I've split in two. Um, so I've got two more years and I'm sort of slowly chugging that along on the side. Um, but no, it's it's not been easy. God, well it's you, it's good to hear though. You know, you obviously do, Ellis has his bit, bits of biz on the side and you, you see a lot more uh, of the players, younger players, actually filling their time with actual business stuff or yeah. planning for the future, which has not always been there. Which was exactly the point I was going to pick up because we had Alex Dombrandt in the other day who was lauding his university days. I mean, obviously, there were one or two pretty unsavoury incidents on the field, but he said he was a much better person for having done it. It's, mm. I mean, is that, do you see a slight sense in better people making better rugby players, whereas perhaps five and ten years ago, people were just talking about academy kids who knew nothing but Monday to Friday training and possibly getting a game on Saturday? Um, I think you hear about like the more obscure stories of people coming in. That's probably why it gets highlighted so much. You know, like Dom has been at the the uni scene and, and getting a pro contract through that way. And then I can't remember who it was, but there's one boy who plays for England at the moment. Who was it who didn't actually have a club and then came in at, like 22? Nick Dolly. Yeah, was it was, Dolly? He was down. No, he, he, he was came over to see his, for a bit. see his nan. Do you know that? No. He came over to see his nan when he was 18. Is it? Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and played a trial game randomly for sale and got a contract there and decided to stay. 
Is that right? <laughs> was he 18? Yeah. I think he was 18, yeah. He was about 18. Yeah, right. yeah man, his brother. He's got a brother who plays at Cov. Mm. I think so, yeah. He's a fly off. Okay. He's a fly off, isn't he? That's fly off. Yeah. yeah. Sid, I think his name is. <laughs> It's not Sid, is it? Sid Dolly. It's that sounds not, class, that looks Sid Dolly. <laughs> Sid Dolly's a character in something. You know, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, gotta be, I know. Yeah, he is. You know, yeah. picking up the conversations in the Leicester uh, canteen, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> was it him? I don't know. Yeah, it was him. Sid? <laughs> we'll roll with that. <laughs> we'll get that. We're just making stuff up, which is fairly standard. But it is, I mean, do you see a bit more of that? Because even someone like Bevan Rod has, <laughs> has come up rapidly on the outside and wouldn't necessarily be a sort of academy product in a conventional sort of get in the gym and we'll see you when you're ready. Yeah, I think like certainly back sort of when, when you were playing tins, it was always not the not the old guard essentially, but people would always drag their careers out a lot longer, wouldn't they? And you'd always have faith in people because of what they'd done in the past. Whereas now I feel the game's moving so quickly and people are doing like mental shit now that you couldn't do 10, 15 years ago. If you don't adapt with the game, I feel you get cut loose quite quickly. So that's right. why I think you see such a big rollover in quite a lot of players coming through because... Since Brownie, really, there haven't really been many fullbacks who take the ball out of the air like Fred has there. No. So he's probably the last of, of that kind, wouldn't he? Brownie back in that yeah. day. So I guess that's why you see the, the turnover. Maybe not so much with that because he was there for a long time, wasn't he? Like Biz. Yeah. He, he was, was angry enough to stay there for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone came there, he made sure they went. Quickly, yeah. I, I did some pre match with him at the South Africa game. He's still pretty angry. Yeah. It's a shame because he, he's, he's, he's actually mellowed, a legend. He's well. it. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. But I think, um, you know, I think the competitive fire still burns. Yeah. You can put it that way. I, I had uh, I didn't have an argument with him on Twitter, but had a discussion. I'd, Disagreement. Yeah. Well, I, I said when he he put on something about when he was stealing the ball, I said, mate, you weren't even on your feet, so it's a penalty anyway. And I think I've saw, seen that. He sort of yeah. went, he went off me, and I texted him. Uh, I texted him. I texted him and said, mate. Let's just make it seem like we're having an argument. I'm not really bothered about Le- it. Left but... you on red. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but then he was like, okay, it's fine. Right. Uh, don't be like that. Um, so yeah, so tell us, so you're, you're desperate to finish the degree. You've come this far, you're going to get it done. Yes, I, I did sort of query, I think last year, I was doing my second year, it, was, it got very, very tough to sort of keep that going, especially with COVID going on, it all moved online and there was just complications and I, I sort of questioned whether it was the right thing to do and would that, affect my rugby because that was the biggest concern I think at the time was you know I'd want to do that stuff but I can't let that affect you know my career so I managed to get through that and then now the uni have been brilliant splitting my year I've got way less way less work to be getting on at the minute but I suppose the best thing about it for me is just having something to do on the side I think it's nice it's very intense isn't it it's very intense um, what we do and you're in that bubble and it's it's a lot so it's nice sometimes to get back uh, I've got mates at uni who I'll probably be with for a long time um, and just sort of being like this is like having a separate not a separate life but a separate bubble and it's nice yeah. to sort of that for the for the head just to be in and out and and you are you living in in, in uni digs and with <laughs> am I allowed to ask this or not why are you laughing no tell him no no I'm in yeah I'm in, I'm in I was in halls in my first year now I'm in a house in Loughborough so in the, in the student town um, I live with Johnny, Law and, and Dan Kelly who both play at Tigers as yeah. well and then two lads who are students so it's a really nice mix yeah. of us boys going in and out we've got boys at uni Go on. No, it's just a party house. I, I, oh, you'll get, right, you'll get yeah. more. You'll get more. Sounds like the old House of Pain. <laughs> it's similar. Times have moved on. Far. <laughs> We've adapted. And, uh, yeah, exactly. And I, I'd love to know how the two guys who Is there just... a shower and a wardrobe yet? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I'd love to know how the two guys who are just trucking along doing their um, their university degree, uh, uh, how they find living with the England fullback and a guy who made his England debut in the centre in the summer. I mean, there's the, the sort of do you get out of the washing up and the the laundry, or is that's it... got to be good for you to um, switch off having boys who actually don't really? That's the thing because do they, they don't... care at all? No, we, well, well. They, I think they do, but they don't. They like being in your they're, slipstream. Exactly. Yeah. They're like we argue, we yeah. we just act. It's so normal, and I think that's the best thing. You go home, and and you know they're brilliant. They're just cracking on with uni life, complaining about things. We complain. It's it's brilliant just to sort of have those guys there, um, who, who just they're, we're all just good together. I love it. A little bit jealous in some ways. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just oh, close my. to living both. Both lives as he can be. I think that's. I think that's amazing. I think you know. You go back, even though we say there's some di- differences from back in the day, but that's what you want. To, you just sort of kept quite grounded. You kept quite normal. You know, we, I used to live in the house with Bolsh and Mirzi and and Lofty when he was there, and you just sort of crack on with it. I think. I think it's 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 fantastic. I think it's great that they've got something on the side. I, I often sort of think if I'd have gone to, to Durham University, where would I have? 
would that have been good for me or would it have been bad for me? But you can it would have been very good for Durham. That's the main <laughs> thing. Possibly not. But, you, uh, but then you, I can only look back and go, well, I made the right, it worked for me. But yeah. you never know, it could be better. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, very interesting. So t- tell me a little bit more about, about life at Leicester at the moment for you. Because again, that's sort of happened. I mean, it's obviously taken longer to come together, but or you've had more time, I suppose, you know, in the saddle. But do you feel very comfortable there now because you've come through the academy, et cetera? Is that, is um, that a club that's fits for you definitely I love I love being at Leicester um, I think there's something special going on there at the minute we're building something really nice and the club's pulling together um, comfortable no in the sense that you know it's still a place you have to go and you have to compete and you have to work hard especially under Steve um, it's not an environment where you can sort of get by day to day and, and do the bare minimum I think you, you'd agree wouldn't you it's, it's a place where the boys go in we know we've got to work hard um but I've been there three years now and, and a lot's changed since I've been there. Obviously, Geordie was there to start with. Now Steve's come in. Um, a lot of boys have come in. A lot of boys have gone out and it's been sort of weird being at the bottom and seeing that all happen um, ahead. But there's a, a really good group of guys there now. So yeah, loving it. How's it been for you in um, the three years? How have you seen him change in the last three years? Because obviously, you know, three years ago and where he's gone through, through, you know, playing for England regularly, being mm. an England captain, obviously now being captain of the club. How have you seen... Careful, Fred. I was scared. I've got now. <laughs> I was scared of him when I first went there, as were all the academy we, we lads. All, we all were. But that's not because he's <laughs> still a, are. He, you're just a scary, but you have got a. You do look quite scary, mate. Sometimes. Fair um, enough. Fair enough. But like again, when you get talking to you, you're not you're not scary at all, are you? Um, we just spent an hour and a half on the train together. So <laughs> there we yeah. go. Can't be that bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have that out, mate. You had your coat on. I think if you had that out, I'd have had to move. No, you get way too comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> up straight in the head. Um, no, he's been on a. Uh, yeah, he's had a. You've had a hell of a three years as well, haven't you? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's um. You've had. I was following on from what you were saying just then. It's weird because like you've had a very weird start to your rugby career in terms mm. of what's gone on at the club. You know, you come when we were eleventh, and now obviously we're we're flying. So it'd be very. It's exciting for you because obviously you've got your best years ahead of you, of course, because you're very young. But it's weird that you're going to now see how rugby clubs work, you know, like because mm. it wasn't working very well before. And then now you're going to see how it like progresses and you're going to learn so much where I'm sort of now in like the middle of my career where I've seen all the sort of different dynamics. And you, you've done so much in such a small space of time. I'm jealous of you. Do you think, do you think like the young players, you know, you say you're building something and you've got you've got quite a few long, young lads at Leicester as well. Do you think everyone sort of from that academy who is coming through just sort of fed off each other and each other's success? Your academy days were mad, weren't they? Like they you were. won everything. Yeah, we went we went back to back in the academy league. We won that two years in a row. And there's still from that team, there's a lot of us still there. You've got George Martin, Jack Van Portfleet. I'm really close to those boys. Um, so there's a really good group of young lads at the minute. Um, but then saying that there's a brilliant blend of you know guys like Genji more experienced guys um, and there's not there's no hierarchy is there there's no, no. We've, we've had these many caps you've had these many caps you're, it's, it's just everyone's able to mix in this environment and there's that great blend of sort of youth and experience um, and I think that's that's working for us at the moment one of the things we've most enjoyed actually with you being the fourth wheel on the car is it's very easy to get to the end and then tell the story retrospectively, but it's really good fun to be able to tell the story as it happens. And your story has been, I mean, it, I mean, we're talking about you really being in a, in a hurry and getting a lot done very quickly, but actually your journey over the last three years has been amazing. And, and I'm, I'm not just sort of throwing that out there. It's been a real sort of discovery, I suppose. Do you, do you look it's, back on that? I'd say it's been like a bit of a coming of age, isn't it? It's yeah. been the... the is that fair or not? You're looking down. No, I'm thinking. I'm just trying to think of what's happened in the last three years. It's always been, been <laughs> but, wild, hasn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, even if you go back to like Sausage Gate and and the beer post match, I mean, you were already doing stuff with us at that point, and it was we were very excited that there was someone out there in the media sort of saying a little bit of what they thought rather than what mm. they're being told to say. But you've gone now from a guy who was angry and sort of possibly not necessarily getting it right all of the time to now the captain of the club hugely respected and leading England in the way that you do. I'm just interested at this point how you reflect on your three years. I haven't really yeah, asked you that no, as a sort of a no, journey it's a, point. It's a big question. Um, I haven't really thought about it too much. Um, like Fred said, it's tough to, to stop and think when you're, when you're in it the whole time. We had a lot of time off in the past sort of two, two, three years. So obviously with the World Cup and COVID and obviously we had six months off but you didn't really think about rugby in that time. So um, I guess, yeah, like Tin said, um, I feel I've always been the same. 
weirdly, I know it seems like I've changed a lot, but I've always been the same. And like with Fred coming in when he was 18, like I thought he was just quiet and, but he's, you're funny. You're a funny kid. <laughs> he's, he's, he's hilarious, you know, and like seeing him come into his own and it's almost like the more game time or the more minutes you get and it's not a hierarchy thing, yeah. but you know what it's like. Yeah, you don't, yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. go, I won't, start giving Coley abuse when I first yeah. I did a little bit but you, you, you won't start <laughs> do you know what I mean you're not that close with them so when you build relationships you get more out of people and I wasn't comfortable speaking to the media or, or doing press at the club and stuff so I probably held myself back a lot and then the wheels came off a little bit at Tigers and we started doing the mental interviews with the yeah all that stuff and that's obviously in the past um, <laughs> but I feel that the more you play and you sort of feel a little bit more comfortable to get your own opinion across and actually have have a, a stance and an opinion on things. Whereas before, when you haven't played, it's like, I'm not earning your stripes. I don't want to go back to that old sort of yeah. power trip thing. But you, you have got, yeah, you have got any stripes, I guess. You've got to like play a little bit before you sort of surface your own your own character. Well, com- comfort on the field leads, leads to comfort off the if field. If you're playing bit, well, you it? could probably yeah. have a point of view on something. But, but if you're not pulling your yeah, weight, then yeah, that's when yeah. people start and, to lack confidence. And, and if you're playing every week, you you get you naturally get that confidence because you you know people are relying on you every week and that, that yeah. then takes it off the field and into thing. I was thinking as well, obviously babies came into your life and being yeah. a dad and everything, it, they'll they'll settle you down in a little bit of no, way it, and make you focus it on It definitely what's gives important. you perspective on stuff. Um but again everyone's like, Oh, you've changed so much over a few years. I, I really don't think I have. I think like people just listen to me a bit more. <laughs> so, so why have perceptions changed then? No, you, I, I think they have changed yeah, dramatically. Yeah, hugely. And I, I have no idea why. It's, it's a big uh, sociology study that we should we should put forward probably. Oh, documentary. Um, yeah, somewhere. definitely. Because no, I, I completely agree with you. I actually had a quite a good um, conversation about today. The European rugby put out Ellis Gann, rugby's bad boy. And then our media guy was like, well, what if they put that out? You're not a bad boy. And I was just like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. It's quite weird that they've got yeah. that perception of me to... To put that Does up. it frustrate you? Though? No, it doesn't because it's a. I guess it was something that I carried around me when I was younger, and I probably thought, yeah, that's quite cool. Was that because <laughs> you do, don't you? Want people to think you're mint and hard and whatever. But now you couldn't care less. So I guess it's now, something that you want to drop. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> no, it's, it's it's a very hard tag to drop, isn't it? Like first yeah. impressions, what people perceive you as. I still got. I had someone tweet me. People are just they're mental. Someone tweeted me saying, "I can't believe Ellis Gange sings the anthem with such lack of passion." I wasn't even playing, mate. I was in quarantine. Right. So. That's the lack of knowledge that's out there. Yeah, so yeah. everyone's opinion is always going to be a bit faded, you know? They haven't really got a clue what's going on behind the scenes. But I guess it's just tough to drop that um, old facade. Um, I, I want this to be taken in the right way, but you've got the world at your feet right now. You, you, you are killing it in everything you're doing. Do you worry about a dip or about... <laughs> What happens when Only when wrong. people Did, talk about it, yeah. Yeah, but, um, but, 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 but I, I'm genuinely interested as to whether you, as a young guy who is r- rising rapidly, are people preparing you for what reality looks like when perhaps a, a loss comes or a performance doesn't go your way, etc.? Yeah, I think that's something that's always... I wouldn't say it's in the back of my mind all the time, but it's definitely something I've thought about. You know, you, you have a couple of good games and people start, you know, spreading gospel and... Blah, 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 but... It, it is a worry because there's, you know, it's not going to be every game a perfect performance, a man of the match performance. That's not, that's not human. Um, so there's, there is a slight worry, you know, when, when things don't go so well, well then what, what are people going to say? You know, you, you can't, it's almost like, how do you live up to that? And yeah. there's pressure, isn't there? When, when people say those things, you know, you go into a game week and you do feel that pressure and that, like you feel like you have to do something or you have to, play to a certain level to sort of satisfy these people who are who are calling you good and stuff and I think the biggest thing for me now the biggest challenge is just not not rising to that or feeling pressure of that expectation you know I've just got to go out there and do my job and I think that was the, the best thing about the England camp I think they were very clear <laughs> as coaching staff you know just do your job just just have a game where you do a job and if all 15 23 men do their job then you know we've got a good chance of winning the game and I think if you approach a game like that you start not to think about all these other things like yeah. the oh, noise. have I done something like this it's going to go yeah all that stuff yeah. um, you've just got to go out there with sort of not limited vision but just focusing on on those little things and it's a sensible fearlessness yeah I, 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 having spoken to Fred for 30 minutes now I'm definitely not worried about him getting too big for his boots and going off on the rails and thinking no. I think <laughs> There's a level head there that that knows how to get the best out of his performance every week. Knows where he fits into the team that he plays in, and that's all you can do. Yeah, I mean it's so cliched, but 
it is only about the next game. It's only, a, and that's what you do, and you just focus on it. If you don't play well for Leicester, you don't play for England. If you don't play well for England, you don't get the chance of being in the Lions or in the World Cup. And so it's all just a staging process. That as long as you focus on the process that you're in, yeah. and then the stage that you're playing at, even if it means you're coming back from injury and it's a second team game, that's the, if you've got to play well in that second team game to go to to get back in the first team, and and, and that's the best way of looking at it because. If you don't play well for your club, your heartbeat, then you won't get the other stuff. It's plain and simple. Yeah. It 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 does feel like there's a sort of a level of sense across everything at the moment. Is that is that fair? There's a sort of a real excitement both in Leicester and England, but it 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 feels a little bit like the hype train has slowed down just around young guys coming through. Or is that is that just am I making that up? What do you mean? Well, it, I, as in, it's not as big a deal it, it, it if a twenty-one-year-old exactly. is now playing fullback. Exactly, for exactly. Yeah, it seems a little. Everything seems a little more controlled in the rugby world. Mm. I think backs always sort of peak a little bit earlier than than forwards. Anyway, um, yeah. obviously, you can't say that for Bev because believe it or not, he's only twenty. Yeah. Tw- is he twenty-one? Twenty-one. Yeah, he looks older than he. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough paper round. Yeah. Into the wind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think like it's it's not as shocking now seeing like Radwa and Fred and those boys come through. But like I said earlier, that sort of the older crop of players that used to get picked week in, week out for for what they've done in the past, they they don't go missing, but they they it's a cycle of life, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's how it goes and careers come to an end and someone else gets an opportunity and obviously people clutch at like clutch at straws for as long as they can, but you, it's good to see youngsters get the opportunity and when they take them it's very hard to get them back out. Yeah. Obviously, we had this discussion around around where Northern Hemisphere rugby is and where it sits, and and you know, every I spoke to a Southern Hemisphere person today, and he's saying everyone down south is now watching. They think it's sort of the uh, you know the best league in the world right now, and and I think you look at the games and you look at the the semifinals and finals of the of the tournament last year. Then you look at this Autumn Nations Cup. You look at the Six Nations. You look how strong it is, and then you know what France have done with their under twenty champ two under twenty back-to-back champions now basically making up that squad I think you know that if you're young enough you're, you're if you're good enough you're old enough no matter what the age and it's just about giving those chances and I'm just glad that we're a sport that is now looking at giving the kids the chances when they when they deserve it because they, they're all all the no one's getting in there who doesn't deserve it it doesn't happen by anymore. chance yeah. yeah nothing happens by chance anymore let's talk about the England run then so it's summer when did you know you were going into England camp? Um, I got an email. Um, I think it was about a week before, right. to sort of say that you're in like a pool of players, so you're not in the squad, but you're you're being considered. Um, I would have loved to have seen him being in a student house and have to look on CFAX like back in the day. It just yeah, has that feel about it. Or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I was added to a WhatsApp group. Um, which I think was called Summer Tour or something. And I think that might have been two couple, of, maybe even less, but very, quite short notice. Um, and had, the, had you planned Ibiza followed by Magalhaes? No, unfortunately <laughs> not. No, have, absolutely not. We had our um, end of season piss up though and you took it very easy, didn't you? I did take it very easy, yeah. It was actually the Euros was on at the same time. Mm. Um, so that was tough to, to miss out on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he says as an um, understatement. Yeah. But, so the WhatsApp group comes and you're like, crikey. Yeah, wow, this is like... Um, a massive you know opportunity you know it's like a bit surreal at the time actually because it was sort of my first season of of playing you know cons- consistent rugby with with minutes um and I wasn't that ho- I was hopeful um and I would have been devastated if I if I'd have not been in that squad um but I just had the mindset it wouldn't you know it wouldn't be the end of the world there's there's plenty more opportunities and and that four weeks I think was one of the most important, well, not one of the most, but I learned probably the most in my career to date from that four weeks, I think, um, over that summer. Um, and I think that was huge in terms of taking that into this season yeah, and then pushing on more. So what did you learn? I was going to say, Eddie, Eddie talks about that, about upskilling and learning. Did you go away with the realism of where you needed to be operating? Yeah, if definitely. You were... I think, you know, that there's a lot of clarity about what you need to do and and what what skills you need to work on what they expect from you um and the coaches there were brilliant um they were they were really hard and really but they p- picked you up on absolutely everything you know there'd be attack drills there'd be back drills where you know you wouldn't even be sort of you wouldn't think you're even doing anything but then the coaches on you like um are your hands up are you are you square just those little reminders um and they were brilliant for me because I never used to think about that when I play. And now I'm constantly sort of checking myself and my state and and what I'm doing. Um, 
And they just had some real good guys there. And it, it wasn't just that. It's been with guys at the time like Henry Slade, those guys who have, who have done it for years. And you go in and learn from them as well. Um, are, you a, are you a sponge for information? Do you want as much as you can possibly get? Or do you just like a couple of little bits to focus on as you go? I wouldn't say... I think sometimes information, like having too much is a bad thing. I like to to sort of make it very clear. Um, sometimes you need a lot of information, but I like it when it's bullet pointed, you know, it's precise. You have got a clear, you walk out a meeting with a clear sort of yeah. idea of, of what you need to do or what, or what the plan is. Um, but like, if you go into a camp like that and you're not being a sponge, you you know, I couldn't go in there and not try and take as much out of it because that would just be a waste. And I yeah. said when I, when I went in and Steve said to me and, and Smithy and, and the coach Lester said, just make the most of it. Just try and learn everything, take everything away. Um, just do whatever you can. Um, so that was the best bit of advice I had from those guys. And I thought it was a really, really good, really good month. <laughs> um, everyone loves stash. When you get the bag with, I mean, you get you get more kit than you could possibly know what to do with. Is that is that quite a Christmas moment? Yeah, definitely. Big old suitcase with, with the name <laughs> on. I think when I took that back to the room and opened it up, it was uh, it was pretty cool. Um, but are your flatmates now walking around yeah. in your <laughs> spare socks and <laughs> they don't tend to wash much anyway? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, no, I, I, those are strictly at home with a lock on. My brothers like to help themselves as well to that sort of thing. So no, I've been very strict with that. Under lock and key, and then the debut. So you get the, you get notified when that you're going to um, make your first start for. I think England. it was the Thursday. Um, so we're playing on the Saturday. Uh, found out on the Thursday morning. Um, and then an inkling through training during the week that you're going to be starting. No, there. That, see that's the thing. They, you know, there's it's an environment where you you don't know until you're told. There's no, there's sort of no. You, you just haven't really. You, everyone has an inkling, but. Um, you just at training. It's so competitive. Everyone's throwing their their hands in the hat. You genuinely you turn up to that meeting on Thursday and you and you don't know, um, and it's quite a scary, daunting feeling because you sat there think you, you're waiting for your name. Obviously, fifteen it goes one. To, you, you're waiting as he's reading it out, and you're just sort of hoping you've done enough. And then hearing that name, uh, it was a bit like wow. Um, and it was a lot of lads debuts that day so yeah. it was a brilliant moment you know after that was announced the boys just getting around each other you know lots of hugs pats on the back I think it was a really cool moment um, do you do in that moment do you do extraordinary pride unbelievable excitement a little bit of fear <laughs> crikey you know a bit of disbelief what is the emotional roller coaster for someone like you who's come very yeah. quickly onto the scene and, and now it's on I think it was all of those things um I went back to my room after and rang, obviously, mum and dad. They were the first two people I rang to tell them. Um, and that was a cool moment. They were over the moon, you know. They were, they were probably, you know, waiting in anticipation for that phone call. Um, but it's just, there is a bit of disbelief and there's also certainly a bit of fear because, you know, you're about to represent your country and that's, you know, a special thing. So um, it was a nervous couple of days. I think building into that match, it was, it was the first time. So um, I think there were 10,000 at that game. Yeah. Um, 10,000 at that game and I think that was nice in the sense that it's like built into it so I was able to play at Twickenham in front of 10,000 and then yeah. obviously this autumn it's absolutely packed to the rafters um, but it was like a steady introduction which I think was was a really good thing Was it good having the skipper as a club mate? Yeah definitely exactly I think when you talk about your journey you know over that three years I think something that you know you'd say the last year certainly something you've become unbelievable that is leading talking you know there's if there's one man that can get someone fired up in the, in the, in the huddle before a game it's this man I don't know you you um, you get the boys going um, so that's that was cool to have Genji there Wellesley Hazy as well you know a couple of us making our debuts um, so it's nice to go out there with some familiar faces definitely Are you enjoying the leadership thing? Yeah <clears throat> I think like for my career so obviously I've probably seen it all in terms of like I've been out of favour I've been the main kitty for a bit and then shoot back up and, and spat back out. So I, I know what these boys are going through when they're not picked. So I know what it's like to get announced that you're, you're debuted, you know. So I, I've, I've felt all these emotions. So I feel in that summer tour, I think we had 16 debuts, potentially more on that first test. So I, I knew on my debut, because a lot of the boys who played in that old mutual wealth thing back when it was that, weren't going on the tour and they weren't that G'd up for the game because it's a bit of a nothing game to say because yeah. the Prem final was on so a lot of boys were calling it a nothing game and for me it was my debut, it was the biggest day of my life so I didn't feel that special about it, um, as sad as that is to say and I knew that I wanted to make it really special for these boys so in the week I just told them look, 
every single time we get a try because you're going to get a fair few tries without sounding like a prick against USA and Canada. Kind of, there's going to be a fair few scores. Um, let's celebrate as much as we can. Um, and like boys really ad- like adopted mm. that, didn't they? And they loved it. And I think you saw like you saw how happy we were for each other. I yeah. think when Radders went in for that hat trick, like you saw how much it meant to the other lads, you know, knowing how he was feeling. And I think that that was the biggest thing about it. Like the boys were just so proud to be playing with each other, and we knew how much it meant for everyone because we we're all doing it together. Um, and I think that was just like that was the best thing about that camp. We're all in it together. We're all doing it together. So it was nice to sort of go and see everyone do well. What was your song on the bus debut? Oh, mine was, uh, it was the Euros at the time, so I sang uh, Atomic Kitten Hole again with the Gareth Southgate <laughs> twist. That um, was class, actually. Which went down well, actually. Yeah. It did go down very well. It's a very strong option, that. No, mm. no one can take that away from you. The, um, the, the, the I think Eddie said off the back of these autumns that there's just, a, there's a real energy and unity. And I know you obviously only did a week of it because of discuss this COVID, well we had, I had three weeks because of the week prior week prior and then I was there for the whole Australia week when yeah. I'm on the Friday thanks for bringing it up right <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah okay I didn't mean to sort of bring it up in, in that context but um, as somebody who's been there for three four how long have you been there five, you went 2016, 2016 to Australia yeah, God, five years. so you went to your yeah, fifth year wow that has gone quickly but uh, is it fair to say that this group has got I mean obviously the World Cup squad was very very tight as well but mm. what is what is would it, how would you describe the current squad in its natural? Like, right. I guess natural, like it's a it's a natural bond. I think that 2019 team we had to work really hard to get that tight. Whereas I feel this team sort of fell, it just fell into place. Like Ben Youngs came out of that campaign. I spoke to him today actually at the club, and he said like he he hadn't felt like that for a long time in an England squad. Which how good is that to wear someone who's got 113 Test caps mm. now? Mm. Maybe more. I don't know. Um, he's edging Leonard, do not he? Yeah, yeah. I'm very seven. close. I'm hot on his tail. Um, for someone who's got that many caps to be able to say that he's been a part of a fair few squads, it's uh, it's really good to hear. And why is that? Why is it? Why is it more natural? <sighs> I think it's it's a brand new group of players, really. Isn't it? There's so many different faces in there. Yeah. Um, and like Tin said earlier, nowadays you've got young. If you're good enough, you're old enough. So you've got a lot of young people who are very different to the the old crop of players, personality-wise, the way they want to play the game, and the game's changed a lot. I don't feel you have to fight that much against coaches because they all want to sort of. They'll recognise what your skill sets are and they want to play a sort of more modern brand. And I think all the players that are coming through now want to play that brand as well. So I, th- yeah. I feel you're already on a, like, not throw back to the days where, you know, if we did an overhead pass or through the leg pass and it didn't go to hand, you'd probably get filled in in the change rooms <laughs> afterwards, you know, whether it be Ben Clark or whether it be whoever. So I, whereas now I think everyone's sort of on the same page yeah. and they all want to play the same way, which and a lot of you all know each other and I think you're just getting a, a nice natural mix of people who want to play but are also very talented at the yeah. same time. Eddie got asked the question after that SA game I was watching the, the post-match who got man the match in that game? It was in the SA game you got it I didn't even know that class I think I went to get a drink I was always teeing that up no you got the game before did you? Hit him. <laughs> you got both I was on yeah. SA that's class isn't it yeah. well done boy what did you get for that out of interest what did you get um, um, a nice bottle of champagne lovely Yeah. yeah. Didn't that, that went in 10 else. seconds with the straw absolutely not no, that's unreal I didn't know that and then I listened to Eddie's things he took ages to come out didn't he he was in the changing room I suspect telling the boys well done and that and then who's what's the bloke's name who does the Mark Dedden Smith him yeah he uh, he said something like everyone says that you've got this certain type of way you want to play and Eddie was like that's a silly thing to say because I've just coached the players the way they can play is the way we play do you know what I mean and that actually hit home with me a little bit I thought fuck I've never really thought about that Yeah. because everyone assumes this is the way the coach wants to play yeah, yeah. when it's not because if you haven't got people who can play that way then you're mm. not going to you're not going to coach that way. And but, I've seen that almost. Well, I was like going to say, but that, that hasn't always been the case, has it? Well, no, because we've had a very different crop of players, haven't we? Yeah. Um, I think like sort of, I've definitely had coaches where they've got a certain way they want to play and that is the way you play. And if you can't do that, then you get dropped as opposed to yeah. sort of encouraging them to do what they're best at, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I th- I, but I think you, I do also think you're seeing a massive shift in coaching in terms of people recognising that. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at Al Sanderson, you look at Borthers, you look at, you know, obviously Mark McCall back, how they their journey's gone. You are seeing these young players, you know, Baxter always talked about, it, it, it's one of his main points would be whether his players look like they were having fun or not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a totally different way of coaching rather than just sticking it down to, right, we're going to play a physical game, we're going to do this all the time and even when you've got a world-class backline or whatever. Whereas now I think, you know, 
people are talking more about relationships, actually buying into it as a group. So you actually want to play for each other, which is, you know, you know, I think uh, Al used the phrase, win, win the heart, win the player. Yeah. So actually make it about something you care about rather than uh, rather than just playing rugby. And I think that real shift is is benefiting the young players coming through. You're not you're not going in with a stigma. You don't you know has being told <laughs> told all the time he's shit and this and that. You're not getting that. You're getting people who want to know, and that's why he he likes got, Eddie. Got to deal in the truth sometimes, though. No, he? that's yeah. why he liked Eddie because even though Eddie would tell him straight, you know, he also tried to build him up as well, and he had banter with it. And and that's about knowing your players, understanding your players, and so yeah, I th- I think it it looks so good over those those three weekends. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, let's let's get into that. You obviously bedded in in the summer, come back, things going really well with Leicester, and then Tonga first up, eighty two thousand. Just mega atmosphere as well. I love the sort of the, the time of day that you played, etc. Away kit. Did, did it feel like a whole other step? Look good yeah, as well. Good. You like it's a nice Boys kit. I, like, good. Yeah. I did like that kit. Yeah. Um, did it feel was, the step up? Certainly. Yeah. I think um, it did. I try not to think about you know the occasion and the stuff until it sort of happens. If that makes sense. So yeah. the night before games, I just try and not even think about the game not think about the rugby not think about anything just chuck something on Netflix sit in the bath just completely trying to distract myself and then we got on the team bus and then that's when it starts really sinking in you know when you come to Twickenham and you see because I've only ever played in front of um, Welford Road 20, 20 odd thousand so to see that many I've never seen that many people before uh, and had to actually play in front of them so when the bus was coming in I was sort of thinking oh like this is <laughs> sort of it's starting to, to, to kick in now um I spoke to, I had a really good chat the night before that Tonga game with um, Joe Marler. I asked him, you know, if he's got any advice for someone who's about to do it for the first time. And he just said, make sure you take it all in. Give yourself five minutes before the game. Just take it all in and sort of appreciate, you know, what's happening. And then once that whistle goes, you're in it, aren't you? And he said, it's going to go quick. As soon as that whistle goes, that'll be done in, it feels. And he was so right. I remember looking at the clock in the South Africa game about, I must have thought it was about 10 minutes in and there was 10 minutes left in the half. It just goes by like a flash because you're so in, it's so involved in the game and invested in it. So I made sure before that Tonga game, when I got to the stadium, uh, the walk from the bus to the, to the change rooms, just to really took my headphones off, um, just to listen to the noise, look at all the people and just, it was just awesome. We it's were funny, talking about it's this funny, We did a pod about it where we were at Twickenham and we were doing the, your walk out. What, Bus seat? Do you always have a, like a bus seat that you go to, and then did you watch the the cars around you and everyone who's in their jerseys as you as you drive in, whether it be down the three one six? Do you still stay at Penny Hill the night before as well? Do you drive from? Penny no, Hill we didn't. No, we stayed closer to to the stadium in the night before, so it was about a twenty minute journey. Right. Um, I had my headphones on in the journey. I like to listen to. I like my disco, 80s, yeah, uh, 80s yeah. disco music. I quite like sort of it still being relaxed. I don't like to. I know you probably listen to some stuff that gets you fired up, but for me, like, I like to stay. You go, you go 80s disco. 80s disco, yeah. I just like to like, What's, 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 what's 80s, 80s disco? disco yeah. Bit of ABBA. Uh, Tainted Love, Soft Cell, that's wow. my go to. Freddie, you've <laughs> done so well for 54 <laughs> minutes. I, I was the, in the Dungannon changing room on the weekend, there was ABBA. I was like, what? <laughs> The devil. The game is changing yeah. rapidly. It's it's just, I love that. It Cycle just keeps me. It just keeps dancing me relaxed. Queen, a bit of yeah. Waterloo. <laughs> um, I just, I just like to stay relaxed. You know that that time before a game, um, and then the lad said, make sure you take your headphones off when you get there. Just, just drink it in. Um, so when we turned in, when the bus turned in, I took my headphones off and was just looking out the window and all, all, all the people there who come to watch us play. Um, and it was that sort of five minutes of getting into Twickenham, the bus driving for all the fans, walking into the change room. It was like, wow, this is, I want to do this for the rest of my life. This is a ridiculous thing to ask, but is there something, when, when, it, when, it, when the ball goes up, at Twickenham, how different is that to playing at Welford Road? Because you know Welford Road it goes up, and you've got twenty thousand people around mm. you. But at Twickenham, you've got eighty-two lights, fireworks. It's is it is it a very different experience, or is it just to get another game of rugby? The the biggest difference is actually I was saying this to someone the other day when the ball goes up because the stadium's so high. Yeah, um, the background of the ball is actually people. Whereas you play at Welford Road and the stadiums in the Premiership, the ball goes up that high that you're looking at the sky in the background. Yeah, um, so it actually helps to have that sort of dark background of, of, of people. You pick the ball up so much easier. Um, but every time that ball goes up, for me, it's you sort of just go 
absolute tunnel vision just looking at the ball. Almost silent. It, 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 yeah, anything. it's almost... I, you probably... It's just white noise almost. It's just in the background. Um, yeah. Just Remember all, when we were at Welford Road the other day and I was trying to take those balls about two months ago? <laughs> hit me on top of the head. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to Fred, I was like... <laughs> A bit ruder than what I'm going to say, but I said, you boys haven't got a clue. Like, I, I could take these eyeballs. <laughs> I've gone like that. Lenny's trying to do spiral. He's trying to change the game. Yeah. He's doing spiral ones. I'm like, I can't get my arms up. AC's gone. I can't get my arms up. So I go like that. I jump and the ball literally just hits me on top of the air. It's like 15 metres. Oh, it's brilliant. Right. Gives you a he tap. didn't catch any either, mate. Right. Right. Fred gives you a tap and goes, go on yeah. Off yeah. Your we, we can take 15 off the versatility. Yeah. 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 We'll leave you as a winger. Um... Go on then. Tell us about tell us about the try, Australia. Yeah, um, it was. I remember there was a breakdown, and I was on the the blind side. There was nothing on the short side, so f- that's a cue for me just to get around the corner, just try and find something. And um, it came out the back. And Marcus is, you know, in those situations where he's got the ball in the loose, he's so good at fixing defenders. And there was a little gap next to him, um, and he he stepped inside, and this hole just opened up, and then. I remember catching the ball and I was like, hang on, I'm through. <laughs> it was all, not almost a bit of disbelief. And then um, it would just happened in like a, it, it was just look at the try line and try and get to the try line. I remember checking to see if Manu was next to me and he wasn't really on. So then it was just get round the outside. <laughs> he was um, so on. So <laughs> was it, I could not believe that <laughs> you... I'd say if that wasn't on, I wonder yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe that you, you batched yourself. It was class. I was buzzing. I was oh, on no, a sofa yeah. screaming. I thought, I thought you were just going to give it, like did give it the old mm. standard draw and give but when you yeah. put the old footwork on you look quick mate thanks mate I've been working hard on it but um, yeah it was almost when when I got to the right and I he didn't tackle me I was, I was I'm in I'm in and you can sort of see in the yeah. my, my face just sort of goes the big I, I, can't, I can't believe it I'm just like I've scored at Twickenham and um, it's just awesome especially when you've got the boys coming in and it's just ah, oh, I'll remember that for the rest of my life it looked like it as well. It's one of those moments where everybody watching can only be unbelievably happy for you. It's just sort of boyhood dreams being realised, really. Scoring for your country at Twickenham against the Wallabies. Um, and, and what was it like off the back of that? Because that was that was the first big tier mm. one game for you in terms of winning it. It, was, it wasn't the greatest game you'll ever play in, but it was mm. a, a solid England win. Off the back of that in the changing room, is it hoops and hollers or is it just keep it calm we've got um, to go again no there's definitely some of that especially the, the day I know you've, I think you've got to have sort of a time period where you, you enjoy yourselves and, you, and you've won the game so I think the Monday after that we were very much on task and we were on to South Africa but the, you know there's definitely time there where the boys are getting around each other and, and celebrating that win um I think the best thing about the South Africa game was was when that game finished it was that was like a nice way to end um obviously with the Australia game almost you, you turn into that South Africa game and think right we've got to go again next week but with that South Africa game finishing it was almost like it was such a brilliant end to, yeah, to the and four the way weeks. it finished does, yeah. does make it yeah, special exactly it? and it was just such a such a great way to finish so um, yeah did you notice I mean everyone talks about the physicality of the box did you notice that in that game definitely I think did you? um yeah, I remember waking up the next morning and thinking, oh, I'm, I'm sore, uh, right. more sore than I had been in, in, in a lot of games. I think, you know, they're so attritional, they're big blokes. Um, and it was a physical game. Yeah. Um, and you do notice that, but it's something the boys said in the week, we we knew. So I think, you know, we sort of had a chance to sort of set ourselves up for it um, emotionally and, and physically. Uh, it's something you, you can't go into a South Africa game and sort of expect it not to be physical yeah. and not to be hard. Um, so that definitely helped sort of knowing that it was coming but it still was ridiculously physical and the fact that you lost Manu and you ended up with a rejig backline and you still played in the way that you played I mean how much confidence do you take as a as a backline squad in terms of the fact you can just bring people in yeah. and you keep doing what you're meant to be doing I think that's the thing it's not it's not the job of the, the guys on the pitch who are starting the game it's, it's the job of everyone so you know you never know when you're going to come on the pitch or, or where you're going to play um, so I think as a, as a unit it's important that we're all behind each other and whatever happens whoever goes off whoever comes on there's trust there's confidence in each other and there's belief that, that we get the job done and March going to 13 he was unbelievable um, he definitely deserved man of the match more than me um, he, he was awesome and then Max did a fantastic job on the wing so it's, it's knowing that you know when guys come on and go off that everyone's still going to dig in for each other it hasn't affected the, the mentality you know no one's thinking oh 
oh, we've he's gone off. He's got. It's not. It's not yeah. like that. You know. Yeah. And talk us through that try. I meant to talk us through the other try. I mean, because then the Australia was the glory. The um, the bot game was the power. Well, always nice when you're six foot five and you're on the kegs. <laughs> Yeah, no, pick and go. Yeah. It, was, it, it yeah. wasn't far off. It wasn't um, far off. It, wasn't far it was off. your second row audition. It would have been it a mighty fine second row audition, audition, to be fair. Yeah, no, Lenny Lenny picked <clears> off. <throat> I sort of wasn't expecting it because um, he was shaping to go the other way, but I, Kobus Reinach was opposite me and I sort of thought, I can, I, I back myself, you know, I can get over. And and Lenny did a brilliant job in tying in the first man and and sent me over the top. So um, I, I do, sort of, I, I remember, remember going that, over yeah. and I, I sort of couldn't really see the try line. I was just thinking, use these long arms and get there. And I was, <laughs> even when I grounded it, I was thinking in the back of my head, I, I have gra- I have grounded it. I'm sure I grounded it. Yeah. Um, but I was still doubting myself then, but no, it was... I'm unbelievably impressed with how incredibly well you played whilst all the time sort of working out, you know, it's sort of working it out as you go type thing. I mean, that do you take quite a lot of confidence from the fact that when you're out there, it looks to the man of born. I always say that, don't I? You love, Sorry. You love you like the a, man of born. You're like a duck on water. Let's do that one. <laughs> I think it's just, I, I love that. Not the pressure, but being in in that environment is just, yeah. I think it gets the best best out of me. I, it's just unbelievable to be there. Um, and then it's just an appreciation of just focus on the job and, and do the job in hand. You know, I said it earlier, when that whistle goes, you, you're not really thinking about who's watching or or the noise or anything you're so invested in that performance and 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 working hard that you don't, you don't really think about anything else so un- until the final whistle goes again at the end that's when sort of that emotion comes back in and you can really sort of look back at it and, and appreciate it and when Marcus's penalty goes over you still had a job to do to still had the job to do I he was didn't, actually he didn't use the minute you took the, <laughs> you took the kick off but when he when he drills it over mm, I was thinking right it's just all I was thinking about at that moment was was the kick off yeah um, I had a feeling they'd come down the middle uh, and I with saw a ra- with a rather large gentleman yeah, chasing you Elizabeth and Jasper in the middle <laughs> I thought here, here it comes um, and that is the most important highball I've ever had to take in my life I was thinking this is if I knock this on yeah. they've, they've got a shot to win the game you know I don't want to lose us the game uh, so when that ball went up, I was I sort of had to when Marcus was doing that kick, just focus absolutely, go through the process, try and get myself ready to, to get it, get myself ready for it. Brilliant. Um, there was a really nice picture at the end. Who who was that with? Uh, that was with my granddad. It was with your granddad. It was with yeah. my granddad. Yeah. So he he did manage to get to the Australia game. Yeah. And he's been alongside my parents, my biggest fan. I absolutely love him to bits. He he's not had it easy in life. Um, and it was like to see him there at the end, especially with everything that had happened. Um, he couldn't even get down, bless him, because he's his body's in bits. But I managed, fortunately, to be able to get up into the stand to to go and give him a big hug. Uh, and that was that was easily that was just such a special moment. Uh, what, what did he say to you? Uh, not much. He just cried. <laughs> <laughs> As did I. It was um, it's one of those moments that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Like that photo is. Class. Unbelievable, Probably isn't it? Friend. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was just so nice uh, to have him there um, and to watch that. So yeah, that was cool. Good. And in the wash-up of it all, it, it, you're sort of just getting used to life and, and what is going to be a very, very exciting career. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think now, you know, back to Leicester, we're in a, we're in a brilliant position. Um, we've got a big game on, on Sunday against Harlequins. So the focus is on that now. And for me, it's just about, you know, trying to add that consistency and, and trying to keep keep playing well and working hard. And then hopefully that's enough, you know, to get back into to the Six Nations squad in February. Um, fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed. And Genji, obviously, there's going to be some frustration in there because you, obviously, not for no reason to do with yourself had to go back and miss those two games are you just does it eat at you a little bit that you weren't involved because obviously you would have been involved and yeah, you would no, have added to that group and now you've got yeah. is that going to take that into this this next period to make sure that no you... I'd be lying if I said I wasn't gutted I was gutted that I wasn't involved but after the Australia game I could really sit there and enjoy the fact that when they won there was no bitterness at all I was buzzing for Bev obviously his first cap and I thought I thought I would be like quite bitter about it all because like I was at home and the boys were enjoying themselves and doing so well and you want to be a part of it. But like the amount of messages I got from the boys and stuff, like saying I like, would love to have had you there and all that sort of stuff, I, that, that was enough for me. Um, and then I really actually enjoyed watching the game, although I didn't know you got man of match. <laughs> um, I genuinely got must have went and got yeah, I must have went and got a cup of tea um, <laughs> because I, I watched the other interview. But 
I, I honestly sat down and thought, I'm really enjoying myself watching this. Um, <laughs> I'd rather be playing, but um, no, surprisingly, I want that bitter at all. Good place to be. There no, you go. There you go. You go after you. Because I was going to wrap up. So you okay, go. No, I wasn't going to say that. Oh, okay, I thought you What I was going to say, <laughs> that's great content. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's where we go. Shower, can take that shit out. Yeah. What I was going to say is that given everything that's been going on over the last 18 months or so, November was extraordinarily good fun to be watching England rugby again. And you were a huge part of that. So um, well done. It's been, it, I loved having you on the show. It's been really, Thank really enjoyable. And I'm very, very excited to see what comes next. I think you've got a lot of fun, not only in Newcastle and Loughborough, but <laughs> hopefully <laughs> treading the big boards of international rugby as well. Thank you for bringing in your show and tell Ellis. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Top marks. Um, just before we go, we have got to do a couple of little bits of GBNR business this week. The pressing issues that you need to know about. First up, we've got a quick message from our sponsors. The magic doesn't happen without them. Have a little look at this. Trading is about knowing the field, foreseeing the opportunity, executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. Uh. Also, we've got uh, a little note around the fact it's December and we've got the perfect Christmas gift for you. So come along to our tour next spring. Apparently tickets are selling remarkably well. We're going to book you in for some dates. Have we sent those over to you? Yeah. Good stuff. Um, you're welcome to come too, Freddie. We've got an ABBA tribute band to keep you happy if you want to be singing <laughs> up on stage. Uh, we're going to be heading across the UK and Ireland to Sheffield, Liverpool, Edinburgh, Cardiff, Newcastle, Manchester, Dublin, Nottingham, Plymouth, Swansea, Oxford, London, Birmingham, Bath and Southend. So, it's not bad, is it? Yeah, I think we should just bring the household. Freddie's got to bring the house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, bring bring the house. Yeah, be there. You can just have front row seats. Tickets on sale now if you fancy that in your Christmas stocking and all of the info is on our website. That should be a lot of fun. And finally, this week, we just want to quickly draw your attention to a single that's been released this week in the charts by Charlie Starmut Smith. I actually met Charlie uh, a few years ago at a wedding, San Alex at a wedding. And I arrived late because I'd been doing Sky stuff. And I rocked up and said, oh, hello, how do you know? Da, da, da. And he said, oh, where have you been? I said, oh, I've been covering the rugby today on Sky. And he said, oh, that's nice. I said, in that sort of sort of way, I said, do you know anything about rugby? And he just sort of gently lowered his eyes to his name place where it said Charlie Starmer Smith. And I looked at it and I went, what, well, that's Starmer Smith? And he went, yeah. I went, okay, cool. <laughs> He is the son of uh, the former England Barbars and Quinns legend Nigel Starmer-Smith. I'm sure many of you have seen this on social and hopefully in the press as well. Anybody of our era will remember Nigel Starmer-Smith, not only as a rugby great, but also as just the most fantastic commentator for the Beeb. Worked with him at Sky as well. Um, he was the soundtrack of our Sundays, wasn't he? Rugby special, oh, oh, England oh, games. Oh, yeah. yeah, brilliant. Ski Sunday into rugby special. Um, N- Nigel, obviously, at the moment, as I'm sure many of you have heard, is very sadly um, suffering with dementia. And so Charlie, his son, has written a song called Spotlight. It's out now. It's raising money and awareness for dementia. Um, it's in honour of his father, who's currently in a nursing home in Oxford. And Charlie wrote the song during lockdown last winter when his visits to see his dad came only through a narrowly opened window. You can see why he's... Um, you know, looking to make an effort here and raise awareness as well. We would love all of our friends, supporters and listeners to get out there, buy and stream the song as you go. Um, and anybody who's been touched by this cruel disease will hopefully pop a pound in the pot as well for Charlie. And for Nigel, um, go do what you do best. And here's just a little sample for you of Spotlight. I see fire in his soul Like you will explode So won't you help me Good on you, everybody. Freddie, once again, it's been lovely to have you on. Thank you very much indeed for coming down. Ellis, lovely to see you. And you go keep your kit, look after yourself. <laughs> Tins, get some sleep this week after a very boisterous couple of days. We have been the good, the bad, and the rugby. Thank you as always for listening. The show's pulled together by producer Queen Shara Kilgallen and the world class fixer that is Matt Chuck Norris. The good, the bad, and the rugby is a folding pocket production. We'll see you next week. <laughs>